A socially awkward boy ended up retreating online to make friends, usually through gaming and gaming-related forums. One night, he decided to meet up and hang out with one of those friends. He had no idea what that friend had in store for him. Today's story begins with an American couple, Barry Bednar and Lauren Lafave. The family moved from the United States to England in the mid-90s. Barry was an oil trader and a shipping consultant, often described as being a millionaire. His wife, Lauren Lafave, was a teaching assistant. In 1999, their first child would be born, a boy they named Breck. A few years later, they would have triplets, giving Breck three younger siblings all at once. The whole family lived together in a nice home in the affluent town of Caterham. By all outside metrics, they were doing very well, and they seemed happy. Brett gradually grew up, naturally, I guess, and ended up attending St. Bede's School in Red Hill in Surrey, and became a member of the Air Training Corps in Red Hill as well. He attended church with his family at St. John the Evangelist Church in Caterham. He was described as creative, being relaxed, being kind, something that netted him quite a few friends that he would play video games with after school. He was pretty passionate about computers and he enjoyed creating content. He often looked after his three younger siblings. They knew him as the kind sort of older brother who would always look after them. The rest of his family would go on to describe him as confident, well-mannered, and social, although he may not appear to be later on. His cousins particularly liked him as well. A Facebook post was later made by one of those cousins saying that Breck was incredibly smart, funny, and cute, but also that he struggled to make friends in real life, often retreating online and meeting people that way. He played a lot of Call of Duty and Battlefield, and sometimes some Minecraft online, mainly with boys his own age, but also with some who were a bit older. After a while, Breck's mother Lauren started becoming concerned about one of those online friends in particular. She took action by limiting his access to electronics and putting in parental controls that prevented him from playing on the same server as this guy, although uh, it did not work. There were several things that led to the fact that made me think Breck was being manipulated and controlled, she said. His personality was changing, and his ideology was changing, and he was starting to refuse to attend church with us. I felt like it was because of the negative influence of this person. He spent more and more time online playing games with Lewis, and less time doing really anything outside of that. A good chunk of his conversations revolved around gaming with Lewis, and a good portion of everything he said began with the phrase, Lewis says, such as, Lewis says I shouldn't have to do chores, or, Lewis says I don't need to finish school because he can get me a Microsoft apprenticeship when I turn 16. That person named Lewis was Lewis Danes, a 19-year-old man from Roseberry Road in Grays. Lewis was a currently unemployed computer engineer who met Breck a while back online while playing games. He grew up as a lonely, only child. Once his parents divorced when he was 16 years old, he started living alone in an apartment that his grandparents owned. His neighbors would describe him as being a recluse. To be more specific, Lewis is said to have met Breck and his friends on a forum dedicated to gaming and not on a game itself, if that matters. He claimed to be a successful engineer running a multi-million dollar company all on his own. However, as you may suspect, he wasn't all he was cracked up to be. His claims ranged from being a bit of an exaggeration to being outright complete lies. It turns out that he had also been accused of violating a younger boy in 2011 and posting certain indecent images of him online. However, despite investigating this, the police would never go on to charge him with anything. He would later defend himself online about this, saying, The media and family have accused me of falsely raping a boy, incredibly whilst two adults were sitting in the next room. The police fully investigated this accusation and found it to have no substance. They found no evidence whatsoever. The boy retracted this false accusation. However, he made it clear that he was pretty sure that all of the accusations made against him were purely made to insult the gaming community as a whole and kind of sully their image, simply painting them in a bad light to suit their own agendas. Breck's mother decided to escalate her complaints with Lewis. 
In December of 2013, she expressed her concerns to the Surrey police, claiming that the man had clearly been grooming her son online. She clearly stated that she felt her son was in imminent danger. Despite trying to end the friendship for months, they were still finding ways to communicate and play together. But again, nothing was done about Lewis. The online friend group that Breck formed with Lewis would go on to split up, with Lewis himself mainly being the reason. According to other members of the group, he started becoming quite a bit of a control freak, uh, twisting people's opinions and kind of pitting the friends against each other. While all of the other members of the group left over this, Breck himself was the only one to actually side with Lewis, and if anything, he actually ended up becoming even closer friends with him after the split up. The quote, friendship, would culminate in Breck being invited to come visit Lewis in person. And on February 16th in 2014, Breck decided to take him up on the offer. Given that Lewis didn't live all that far away, only about 30 miles, it wasn't out of the realm of possibilities for a 14-year-old to pull off on his own. He simply took a taxi out to Lewis's apartment, meeting someone who he thought was a good friend. Breck had originally planned to see his father that night, supposedly they were going to spend the week together. However, he never arrived. So his father ended up sending a text to his mother inquiring about the problem. Breck finally ended up getting in contact with his father, saying that he was going to crash at a friend's house, saying that it was a particular friend that only lived a few streets away, something that his parents were cool with. As far as they knew, there was nothing to be concerned about. An email later leaked showing that Lewis had actually advised him to come up with this lie. Later on after Breck arrived, a pizza was ordered and delivered to the house that night. And that was the last time anyone would have contact with the home until the next morning. That night, Lewis would use duct tape to tie up his victim by his wrist and ankles. There was evidence that Breck was violated after this. And finally, Lewis would finish the night by stabbing Breck multiple times in the throat, killing him within a few seconds. He died at 11pm that Monday night. The next morning on the 17th, following this, Lewis took pictures of Breck's body and ended up sending them to at least two people that they knew, as well as going online and reaching out to other members of their community to tell them that Breck had died. He then threw all of his electronics into the sink and submerged them all in order to destroy evidence. He then showered, changed his clothes, and picked up the phone. Lewis made a call to the authorities himself, claiming that Breck was trying to take his own life, and while working towards restraining him, he accidentally stabbed him. Essex Place Emergency. Hi there. Um, okay. Uh, hello. Um, I need police and a forensics team to my address, please. What do you mean? What's happened? My friend and I got into an altercation and I'm the only one who came out alive. Are you telling me you've killed somebody? Yes, I am. My friend came to stay the night with me yesterday, feeling very down, feeling suicidal. And I woke up this morning, he was in a mess. I tried to calm him down. I hugged him. He grabbed, he, he shrugged me off. You're telling me he is definitely dead? I'm telling, yes, I'm telling you he's definitely dead. I woke up this morning. He was in a mess. He was just standing up. He was in a mess, hands on his face. I got up, I put my arms around him, and I said it was okay. He just shrugged me off and said no. Some, I can't remember exactly what he said. He, he was going on about how he didn't want to go home. He was fed up with his life. And he, I have a pen knife on the side of, sorry, in my room. He picked it up, opened it, and then lost control. I, yep. in self-defense, put my left arm up to block him from stabbing me effectively. We struggled. I got him to the ground. He got up. I got the knife. I grabbed the knife, and I stabbed him once in the back of the neck, I believe somewhere near the brainstem. He turned around tried to carry it on and I, I I think I stumbled on my chest of drawers I fell over I got back up backed away and then I don't remember exactly what happened but the fight ended with me cutting his throat I 
believe I turned around and I slashed his throat. His tone of voice during the call was notably very cold, giving the operator the impression that he was giving a completely false account of the incident. When the police got to the home, Lewis calmly told them, Look, I know he's dead. I stabbed the main artery in his neck. It was later discovered that shortly before Breck was set to come visit Lewis at his home, Lewis had purchased a slew of suspicious items online. These items included duct tape, condoms, and syringes. It kind of amazes me that an Amazon cart like this doesn't trigger some sort of silent alarm. A few short hours later, the pictures of Breck would spread far and wide within their circle online until they eventually reached Breck's siblings themselves, who were only 12 years old at the time. They got messages that Breck had been murdered, with the pictures being described to them in detail. They first got an ambiguous text message saying, Is it true about your brother? If it's true, that's so sad. They called their parents in a panic, but by this time their parents were already being informed by the police that their son had been murdered. The police also confirmed the legitimacy of the photos that were being passed around. A load of police and paramedics were called out to the apartment in which he was stabbed, but it was far too late. There was nothing they could do at that point beyond arrest Lewis on the spot. Breck was later buried on what would have been his own 15th birthday. Lewis Danes would soon enter a plea of not guilty. However, he was to remain in police custody as he awaited a trial in Chelmsford Crown Court that November. He took this time to vent to anyone he could. He even accused Breck's parents of mistreating him over the course of many years, saying, This systematic violent and emotional mistreatment destroyed Breck's self-esteem and confidence, destroyed his hopes and dreams of a career path which he wished to pursue and not one chosen for him telling our community that he was being forced to attend a church of which he had no interest in the months leading up to the events in February 2014. On reflection, I believe this is why he formed this strong emotional attachment to me. Keep in mind that these accounts of mistreatment are only coming from a murderer with a, let's say, spotty past and questionable character. Lewis's trial continued to grow closer and closer, but surprisingly, before it came, he admitted to the murder and changed his plea to guilty. However, he also changed his story. No longer was he trying to prevent Breck from harming himself. Instead, he claimed that Breck had attacked him, angry at him for planning to leave the country to take a new job abroad, saying, I am responsible for the death of Breck, a boy of just 14, despite only being a young adult and just four months into legal adulthood myself. Nothing will change the fact that while he was with me, I had a duty of care towards him and I failed. He knew of my plans and when he saw my suitcase semi-packed and that I was about to leave, I believe this sent him into a further state of panic. This led to a fight which is totally out of character for both of us and ended in his tragic death. His claims of Breck attacking him over his decision to move to another country don't hold much weight as this was the first time they ever met and they were merely online friends. Moving to another country wouldn't make much difference if they were used to only communicating online as it was. He continued to blame the media, again saying that they were only sensationalizing this case in order to make gamers look bad. The rhetoric remained virtually exactly the same as when he was accused of assaulting the other boy several years prior. The sentencing was scheduled to be held on January 12th of 2015 by Mrs. Justice Cox which is a perfect name for someone involved in law. News reports would go on to describe Lewis as a baby-faced killer who looked much younger than his 19 years. Breck's mother would go on to speak out after the hearing, saying that she was obviously left heartbroken by her son's murder. He was murdered on my birthday this year, and so much of me died as well, she told reporters outside the courthouse. Prosecutor Richard Whittem told the court that it was the prosecution's opinion that the murder involved a sexual, sadistic motivation. It was worth making this claim as the law makes specific provisions for the murder of a minor that involves sexual or sadistic motivations. The prosecution stuck with this claim all the way until the sentencing. Lewis's defense claimed that he had Asperger's syndrome, which they said affects his ability to make sound judgments. 
They also argued that there was not enough evidence to prove that the murder had been premeditated, despite the creepy online purchases being known at this point. Sentencing Lewis, the judge eventually ordered him to serve a life sentence in prison with a minimum of 25 years, meaning that he will be, at the very least, around 44 years old by the time he's released from prison, if he's released. The prosecutor, Jenny Hopkins, said, Our case was that Lewis Daines, even though he was only 18 when he committed Breck's murder, was a controlling and manipulative individual who carefully planned this crime. The degree of planning and manipulation by Danes is shocking, and when you consider the young ages of the perpetrator and the victim, it stands out as one of the most cruel, violent, and unusual cases we have dealt with. There were some serious questions being asked about how the police handled this case when it later came to light that he had been accused of assaulting this other boy just a couple of years prior. Even though that case had been thrown out, it should have at least been taken into consideration when he was accused of doing the exact same thing to another boy just a couple of years later. Even before that, when he was merely accused of grooming a boy a couple of years later. Later on, according to news outlets, the Bednar family was filing a lawsuit against the Essex and Surrey police over how they handled the case. In March of 2016, the family accepted a settlement, with the Surrey police apologizing for their mishandling of the case, and they were paid a compensation of an undisclosed sum. In addition to this, the Surrey police stated that they had agreed to implement some recommended changes to their procedures so that other children like Breck are protected. In January of that year, it began to be alleged that Lewis had, somehow, been blogging while in prison. Someone claiming to be him and mimicking his manner of typing perfectly wrote out two long posts defending him to the public. Both letters were posted onto a blog, the first in November of 2015 and the second in January of 2016. The first post in November claimed responsibility for Breck's death. It was believed that the second post was made in response to the BBC making a documentary which showcased the crime called Murder Games. The second post is pretty beefy, it would probably take way too long to read the entire thing, but some highlights include these couple of paragraphs. My real name, Lewis Danes, was always used in the online gaming community. Everyone knew me by my real name. I had no alias. Breck's family also knew where I lived. They knew my contact details and phone numbers. This would hardly be the part of the modus operandi of a sinister internet piece file sadistic groomer, would it? Police found not one single item of text or computer evidence of a sexual nature on my devices. This is fact, but the media insist on using sexual connotations in their articles. There is also no evidence to suggest I said I was dying. This is a fabrication like so much of what is written and said by media and family. This week's Guardian article also contradicts itself so much. For example, the mother's version. It was the start of half-term and he was staying with his father, but told him he was going to his friend Tom's to build a new server. The father's version in the same article says, Breck told me he was going to see a friend. I was happy that he was doing something that wasn't online. Simply, you cannot build a server without going online, so that is fabrication. The father. I've been to Dane's flat. It's a dump. The mother said, Dane's grotty flat. The police photographs actually show a very clean, tidy, modern flat inside and outside, in a very nice residential street, the opposite of what they describe it as. It would take too much time to address all the lies and spin. No photo of Breck was sent to the siblings by me. Why do the media and the family continue to insist, against the police chain of evidence, that I did? Why do they lie about this easily checked fact? I will not go into fine detail about what Brett and I were creating computer-wise, but anyone who reads the retrieved emails available on the internet between us when I was in Dubai and Thailand in the two weeks preceding his death can easily surmise that the fabricated media story is inconsistent with the facts. If I had been this grooming predator intent on killing someone, then I could have easily left the scene and used my passport and airline ticket, which was already bought days before, for my next trip abroad in a few days' time, all able to be checked, and my substantial funds, and left the country. 
uh, I apologize for some of that being a little hard to follow. I read it out exactly as he wrote it, and it's kind of shitty writing, to be honest. Breck's mom believed that the online posts were genuine, feeling that this manner of speaking matched her own online interactions with him in the months leading up to her son's murder, in which she tried to get him to stop talking to her son. She felt that, if he didn't make the post himself directly, he had someone make them on his behalf. The police performed an extensive search of Lewis's prison cell inside and out after the first blog post was discovered. They didn't find any sort of device that he could have been using to post online, but that didn't mean he didn't have one somewhere. The next year, Breck's younger sister started to get horrific messages over Snapchat, messages that recounted her brother's murder in disturbing detail. It's still unknown for certain who sent these messages, but it's believed that they were also from Lewis himself. Messages kept flowing in, consisting of everything from threats to desecrate Breck's grave to threats to harm the rest of her family. Some were simple memes, including this image of a skeleton with text saying RIP Breck imposed above. One of Breck's previous online friends would later lament about what happened online, saying, Words can't even start to portray what a fantastic person you were, but I'm going to miss those long nights of Battlefield. Staying up, playing those stupid thousand-ticket games, trying to compete in arcade scores, talking about random malarkey. A lot of people took this case and hijacked it for their own narratives. Groups out there who push the assertion that video games lead to violence use this case for their own goals. Some religious groups also used the fact that Breck started attending church less and less to make their own points about church being essential to a good upbringing. Either way, many of these points had very little to do with the actual case itself or how it really played out. Later on in 2019, of all things, a stage play was written about this crime by a man named Mark Wheeler. It was compiled using statements from his friends and family and tells the story about how he was gradually groomed by Lewis online. Well, that is kind of a weird note to leave off on, but it really is the only substantial update from this case recently. It seems that Lewis continues to rot away in prison and likely will for quite some time. He hasn't really admitted any fault in this. I mean, he admitted that he did kill him, but for self-defense type reasons. He never really owned up to it. He continues to blame pretty much everyone but himself. Uh, the media, the victims, the parents, really anybody but him. It's uh, probably a good thing that he's put away. Once again, thank you for watching my video. Uh, if you enjoyed it, please give it a like. It really helps it to get seen by other people. And if you enjoy content like this, feel free to subscribe because I'm going to keep talking about it. If you want to support the channel even further, I do have a Patreon account that I keep linked in the description below. And speaking of which, shout out to my top patrons. Mary Ann McCurdy, Jewel G, Wafranz, Arctic Cat, Alan Damiani, David McLaughlin, Marsh, Buffazerk, Jewel Movchan, Winnicott, Adrian Lawley, Kim Peek, Lux Alpaca, Charity, Skooky Maine, Foxlicity, Jackie, Tracer Ferguson, Lonro, Jules Latona, Callahan, Tang, Sash Johnson, and Farius. You guys are a growing group of great awesome people. Thank you and have a good night.